Well, welcome to the story time. I'm going to change up the book we're going to read today. Today we're going to read The Borrowers, Mary Norton, illustrated by Beth and Joe Crush. And I was looking, and the copyright on this, it was first published in 1950. 1953 and 1952. Now, I remember reading this when I was a little girl. And I'm not a little girl anymore. But I'm kind of having fun going back and reading some of these books that I remember. So, we're going to read this one. I'll read probably 30, 40 minutes. We'll just kind of see as we go along how far we get. Now, this is the bars. Chapter 1. <clears throat> It was Mrs. May who first told me about them. No, not me. How could it have been me, a wild, untidy, self-willed little girl who stared with angry eyes and was said to crunch her teeth? Kate, she should have been called. Yes, that was it. It was Kate. Not that the name matters much either way. She barely comes into the story. Mrs. May lived in two rooms in Kate's parents' house in London. She was, I think, some kind of relation. Her bedroom was on the first floor, and her sitting room was a room which was as part of the house was called the breakfast room. Now, breakfast rooms are all right in the morning when the sun streams in on the toast and the marmalade, but by afternoon they seem to vanish a little and to fill with the strange silver, silvery light their own twilight. There is a kind of sadness in them that then, but as a child, it was sadness Kate liked. She would creep up onto Mrs. Mary just before tea time, and Mrs. Mary would teach her to crochet. Mrs. May, Mrs. May, Mrs. May was old. Her joints were stiff, and she was not was not strict exactly, but she had that inner certainty which does instead. Kate was never wild with Mrs. May, nor untidy, nor self-willed, and Mrs. May taught her many things besides crochet. How to wind wool onto an egg-shaped ball, how to run and fail and plan a darn, how to tidy a drawer and delay like a like a blessing above the contents, a sheet of rustling tissue against the wind. Where's your work, child? asked Mrs. May one day, when Kate sat hunched and silent upon the hassock. You mustn't sit there dreaming. Have you lost your tongue? No, said Kate, pulling at her shoe button. I've lost the crochet hook. They were making a bed quilt in woolen squares. There were thirty still to do. I know where I put it, she went on hastily. I put it on the bottom shelf of the bookcase just beside my bed. On the bottom shelf, repeated Mrs. May, her own needle flicking steadily in the firelight near the floor. Yes, said Kate, but I looked on the floor, under the rug, everywhere. The wool was still there, though, just where I'd left it. Oh, dear, exclaimed Mrs. May lightly. Don't. Say, they're in this house, too. That, that what are, asked Kate. The borrower, said Mrs. May, and in the half-light she seemed to smile. Kate stared a little fearfully. Are there such things, she asked after a moment. Has what? Has people, other people living in a house who borrow things. Mrs. May laid down her work. What do you think, she asked. I don't know, Kate said, pulling hard at her shoe button. There can't be, and yet, she raised her head, and yet sometimes I think there must be. Why do you think there must be, asked Mrs. May. Because of all the things that disappear. Safety pins, for instance. Factories go on making safety pins, and every day people go on buying safety pins, and yet, somehow, there never is a safety pin just when you want one. Where are they all? Now at this minute, where do they go to? Take needles, she went on. All the needles my mother ever bought. There must be hundreds. Can't just be lying about this house. Nothing lying about the house, no, agreed Mrs. May. And all the other things we keep on buying again and again and again. Like pencils and match boxes and sealing wax and hairpins and drawing pins and thimbles. 
and hat pins, put in Mrs. May, and blotting paper. Yes, blotting paper, agreed Kate, but not hat pins. That's where you're wrong, said Mrs. May, and she picked up her work again. There was a reason for hat pins. Kate stared. A reason, she repeated. I mean, what kind of reason? Well, there were two reasons, really. A hat pin is a very useful weapon, and Mrs. May laughed suddenly, but it all sounds such nonsense, and she hesitated. It was so very long ago. But tell me, said Kate, tell me how you know about the hat pin. Did you ever see one? Mrs. May threw her a startled glance. Well, yes, she began. Not a hat pin, exclaimed Kate impatiently. A whatever you call them, a borrower. Mrs. May drew in a sharp breath. No, she said quickly, I never saw one. But someone else saw one, cried Kate, and you know about it. I can see you do. Hush, said Mrs. May. No need to shout. She gazed downward at the upturned face, and then she smiled, and her eyes slid away into distance. I had a brother, she began uncertainly. Kate knelt upon the hassock, and he saw them? I don't know, said Mrs. May, shaking her head. I just don't know. She smoothed out her work upon her knee. He was such a tease. He told us so many things. My sister and me, impossible things. He was killed, she added gently, many years ago now on the northwest frontier. He became colonel of his regiment. He died what they call a hero's death. Was he your only brother? Yes, and he was our little brother. <clears throat> I think that was why, she thought for a moment, still smiling to herself, Yes, why he told us such impossible stories, such strange strange imaginings. He was jealous, I think, because we were older and because we could read better. He wanted to impress us. He wanted perhaps to shock us. And yet, she looked into the fire. There was something about him, perhaps because we were brought up in India among mystery and magic and legend, something that made us think that he was saw things that other people could not see. Sometimes we know he was teasing, but at other times, well, we were not so sure. She leaned forward and in her tidy way brushed a fan of loose ashes under the grate, then brush in hand. She st stared again at the fire. He wasn't a very strong little boy. The first time he came home from India, he got rheumatic fever. He missed a whole term at school and was sent away to the country to get over it, to the house of a great aunt. Later I went there myself. It was a strange old house. She hung up the brush on its brass hook and dusting her hands on her handkerchief, she picked up her work. Better light the lamp, she said. Not yet, begged Kate, leaning forward. Please go on. Please tell me. But I've told you, no you haven't, this old house, wasn't that where he saw, he saw, Mrs. Mary laughed, where he saw the borrowers, yes, that's what he told us, what he'd have us believe, and what's more, it seems that he didn't just see them, but that he got to know them very well, that he became part of their lives, as it were, in fact, you might almost say that he became a borrower himself. Oh, do tell me, please. Try to remember right from the very beginning. But I do remember, said Mrs. Mary. Oddly enough, I remember it better than many real things which have happened. Perhaps it was a real thing. I just don't know. You see, on the way back to India, my brother and I had to share a cabin. My sister used to sleep with our governess, and, and on those very hot nights, often we couldn't sleep. And my brother would talk for hours and hours going over old ground, repeating conversations, telling me details again and again, wondering how they were and what they were doing, and they, who were they exactly? Homily, Pod, and little Arietta. Pod? Yes, even their names were never quite right. They imagined they had their own names, quite different from human names. But with half an ear, you could tell my they were borrowed. 
even Uncle Hendri Hen Hendriri and Eagle Tina's, everything they had was borrowed. They had nothing of their own at all. Nothing. In spite of this, my brother said they were touchy and conceited and thought they owned the world. How do you mean? They thought human beings were just invented to do the dirty work. Great slaves put there for them to use. At least, that's what they told each other. But my, bro but my brother said that. Underneath, he thought they were frightened. It was because they were frightened, he thought, that they had grown so small. Each generation had become smaller and smaller and more and more hidden. In the olden days, it seems, and in some parts of England, our ancestors talked quite openly about the little people. Yes, said Kate, I know. Nowadays, I suppose, Mrs. May went on slowly, if they exist at all, you would only find them in houses which are quite old and quiet and deep in the country and where the human beings live to a routine. Routine is their safeguard. They must know which rooms are to be used and when. They do not stay long where there are careless people or unruly children or certain household pets. This particular old house, of course, was idea, although as far as some of them were concerned, a trifle cold and empty. Great Aunt Sophie was bedridden the, through, through a hunting accident some twenty years before, and as for other human beings there, there was only Mrs. Driver the cook, Camp Furl the gardener, and at rare intervals, an odd housemaid or such. My brother, too, when he was there after rheumatic fever, had to spend long hours in bed, and for those first weeks it seems the borrowers did not know of his existence. He slept in the old night nursery beyond the schoolroom. Let me show you the sketch. Then we'll finish reading the page. The schoolroom at that time was sheeted and shrouded and filled with junk. Odd trunks, a broken sewing machine, a desk, a dressmaker's dummy, a table, some chairs, and a disused panola has the children who had used it. Great Aunt Sophie's children had long since growed up, grown up, married, died, or gone away. The night nursery opened out of the schoolroom, and from his bed, my brother could see the oil painting of the Battle of Waterloo, which hung above the schoolroom fireplace, and on the wall, a corner cupboard with glass doors in which was set, uh, set out on hooks and shelves, a doll's tea service, very delicate and old. At night, if the schoolroom door was open, he had a view down the lighted passage which led to the head of the stairs, and it would comfort him to see each evening at dusk Mrs. Driver appear at the head of the stairs and cross the passage carrying a tray for Aunt Sophie with bath oliver biscuits and tall cut glass decanter of fine old pale Madeira. On her way out, Mrs. Driver would pause and lower the gas jet in the passage to a dim blue flame. And then he would watch her as she stumped away downstairs, sinking slowly out of sight between the banisters. Under this passage, he would hear it strike the hours. It was a grandfather clock and very old. Mr. Frith of Leighton Buzzard came each month to wind it as his father had come before him and his great uncle before that. For eighty years, they said, and to Mrs. Frith's Mr. Frith's uncertain knowledge, it had not stopped, and as far as anyone could tell, for as many years before that, the great thing was that it must never be moved. It stood against the wainscot, and the sto stone flags around it had been wore so often that a little platform, my brother said, rose up inside, and under this clock, be below the wainscot, there was a hole. All right, let's read one more chapter. Let's go on to chapter two, because I want to see why the hole's there, don't you? Chapter two. It was Pod's hole, the keep of the fortress, the entrance to his home. Not that his home was anywhere near the clock, far from it, as you might say. There were yards of 
dark and dusty passageway with wooden doors between the joists and metal grates against the mice. Pod used all kinds of things for these gates. A flat leaf of a folding cheese grater, the hinge lid of a small cash box, squares of pierced zinc from an old meat safe, a wire fly swatter. Not that I'm afraid of mice, Homily would say, but I can't abide the smell. In vain, Arietti had bagged for a little mouse of her own, a little blind mouse to bring up a hand like Eagle Tina had had. But Homily would bang with the pan lids and exclaim, And look what happened to Eagle Latina. What? Arietti would ask. What did happen to Eagle Latina? But no one would ever say. It was only Pod who knew the way through the intersecting passages to the other to the hole under the clock, and only Pod could open the gates. They were complicated claps made of hairpins and safety pins, of which Pod alone knew the secret. His wife and child led more sheltered lives in home-like apartments under the kitchen, far removed from the risk and dangers of the dreaded house above. But there was a grating in the brick wall of the house just below the floor level of the kitchen above through which Arietti could see the garden, a piece of gravel path and a blank where crocuses and a bank where crocuses bloomed in spring, where blossom drifted from an unseen tree, and where later an azalea bush would flower, and where birds came and pecked and flirted and sometimes fought. The hours you waste on them birds, Homily would say, and when there's a little job to be done, you can never find the time. I was brought up in a house, Homily went on, where there wasn't no grating, and we were all for the happier for it. Now go off and get me the potato. That was the day when Arietti, rolling the potato before her from the storehouse down the dusty lane under the floorboards, kicked it ill-temperedly so that it rolled rather fast into the kitchen where Homily was stooping over the stove. There you go again, exclaimed Homily, turning angrily, nearly pushed me into the soup. And when I say potato, I don't mean the whole potato. Take the scissor, can't you, and cut off a slice. Didn't know how much you wanted, mumbled Arietti. And Homily snorted and sniffling, unhooked the blade ha and handle of half of a pair of manicure scissors from a nail on the wall and began to cut through the peel. You've ruined this potato, she grumbled. You can't roll it back now in all that dust, not once it's been cut open. Oh, what does it matter, said Arietta. There are plenty more. That's a nice way to talk, plenty more. Do you realize homily, homily went on gra gravely lie, laying down the half nail scissor that time your poor father risked his life every time he borrows a potato? I meant, said Arietti, that there are plenty more in the storeroom. Well, out of my way now, said Homily, bustling ar around again, whatever you meant, and let me get the supper. Arietti wandered through the open door into the setting room. Ah, the fire had been lighted and the room looked bright and cozy. Homily was proud of her setting room. The walls had been papered with scraps of old letters out of waste bas paper baskets. And Homily had arranged the handwriting sideways in vertical stripes which ran across the floor to the ceiling. On the walls, repeated in various colors, hung several portraits of Queen Victoria as a little girl. These were postage stamps, borrowed by Pod some years ago from the stamp box on the desk in the morning room. There was a lacquer trinket box padded inside and with the lid open, which they used as a seti, and that useful Stand by a chest of drawers made of matchboxes. There was a round table with a red velvet cloth which Pod had made from the wooden bottom of a peel box supported on the curved pedestal of a knight from the chest set. Let me show you the borrower's room. Look closely at all the little things they've used to make their room.
This had caused a great deal of trouble upstairs when Aunt Sophie's eldest son on a flying midweek visit had invited the vicar for a game after dinner. Rosa Pick Hackett, who was housemaid at the time, gave it gave in her notice after she had left other things after she had left, other things were found to be missing, and no one was engaged in her place. From that time onwards, Mrs. Driver ruled supreme. The night itself, its bust, so to speak, stood on a column in the corner where it looked very fine and lent that air to the room which only statuary can give. Beside the fire in a tilted Wooden bookcase stood Arietta's library. There was a set of those miniature volumes which the Victorians loved to print, but which to Arietta seemed the size of a very large church Bible. There was Bryce's Tom Thumb Gazetteer of the World, including the last census. Bryce's Tom Thumb Dictionary with short explanations of scientific philosophical, literary, and technical terms, Bryce's Tom Thumb edition of the comedies of William Shakespeare, including a foreword on, on the author, another book whose pages were all blank called Memoranda, and last but not least, Arietta's favorite, Bryce's Tom Thumb diary and proverb book, with a saying for each day of the year, and has a preface, the life story of a little man called General Tom Thumb, who married a girl called Mercy Lavinia Bump. There was an engraving of their carriage and pair with little, little horses the size of mice. Arietta was not a, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was not a stupid girl. She knew that horses could not be as small as mice, but she did not realize that Tom Thumb, nearly two feet high, would seem a giant to a borrower. Arietta had learned to read from these books and to write by leaning sideways and copying out the writings on the walls. In spite of this, she did not always keep her diary, although on most days she would take the book out for the sake of the saying, which sometimes would comfort her. Today it said, You may go further and fare worse, and underneath, Order of the Garter, inst instituted at 1348. She carried the book to the fire and sat down with her feet on the hob. What are you doing, Arietta? called Hominy from the kitchen. Writing my diary. Oh, exclaimed Homily shortly. What did you say? asked Arietta. She felt quite safe. Homily liked her to write. Homily encouraged her form of culture. Homily herself, poor ignorant creature, could not even say the alphabet. Nothing, nothing, said Homily, crossly, banging away with the pan lids. It'll do later. Arietti took out the pencil. It was a small white pencil with a piece of silk cord attached, which had come off of a dance program. But even so, in Arietta's hand, it looked like a rolling pen. Arietta called Homily again from the kitchen. Yes? Put a little something on the fire, will you? Arietta braced her muscles and heaved the book off her knees and stood it upright on the floor. They kept the fuel, assorted slack and crumbled candle grease in a pewter mustard pot, and shoveled it out with a spoon. Arietta trickled only a few grains, tilting the mustard spoon not to spoil the blaze. Then she stood there basking in the warmth. It was a charming fireplace made by Arietta's grandfather with a cogwheel from the stables, part of an old cider press. The spokes of the cogwheel stood out in starry rays, and the fire itself nestled in the center. Above there was a chimney piece made from a small brass funnel inverted. This at one time belonged to an oil lamp which matched it, and which stood in old days on the hall table upstairs. An arrangement of pipes from the spout of the funnel carried the fumes into the kitchen flues above. The fire was laid with matchsticks and fed with assorted slack, and as it burned up, the iron would become hot, and homily, homily would simmer soup on the spokes in a silver thimble and Arietta would broil nuts. How cozy those winter evenings would be. Arietta, her guest book, 
great book on her knees, something sometimes reading aloud, pawed it is at his last he was a shoemaker and made button boots out of kid gloves now last only for his family and homily cried at last with her knitting homily knitted their jerseys and stockings on black-headed pins which sometimes and sometimes on darning needles a, a great reel of silk or cotton would stand table high beside her chair and sometimes if she pulled too sharply the reel would tip up and roll away out of the open door into the dusty passage beyond and arietta would be sent after it to rewind it carefully as she rolled it back the floor of the sitting room was carpeted with deep red blotting paper, which was warm and cozy and soaked up the spills. Homily would renew it at intervals when it became available upstairs, but since Aunt Sophie had taken to her bed, Mrs. Driver seldom thought of blotting paper unless suddenly there were guests. Homily liked things which which saved washing because drying was difficult under the floor. Water they had in plenty, hot and cold, thanks to Pod's father, who had tapped the pipes from the kitchen boiler. They bathed in a small tureen, which once had held pâté de foie gas, which, when you had wiped out the bath, you were supposed to lid, put the lid back to stop people putting things in it. The soap, too, a great cake of it, hung on a nail in the scullery and they scraped pieces off. Homily liked coal tar, but Pod and Arietta preferred sandalwood. What are you doing now, Arietta? called Homily from the kitchen, still writing my diary. Once again, Arietta took hold of the book and heaved it back on to her knees. She licked the lead of her great pencil and stared a moment deep in thought. She allowed herself, when she did remember to write, one little line on each page because she would never, of this she was sure, have another diary. And if she could get twenty lines on each page, the diary would last her twenty years. She had kept it for nearly two years already. And today, the 22nd of March, she read last year's entry, Mother Cross. She thought a while longer. Then, at last, she put ditto marks under Mother and worried under cross. What did you say you were doing, Arietta called homily from homily from the kitchen. Arietta closed her book. Nothing, she said. Then chop me up this onion. There's a good girl. Your father's late tonight. And that's the end of chapter two. And we'll start on chapter three, page twenty three next time. See what happens in this story about the borrowers. Bye y'all. Good night.